Welcome to Capitol View, our look inside and outside the Illinois State Capitol. I'm Jennifer Fuller. Our guests this week are John O'Connor of the Associated Press and Capitol News Illinois Bureau Chief Jerry Nowicki. Gentlemen, thanks for joining us. Thank you, Jen. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Big economic news to start with this week with the announcement from Caterpillar, the heavy manufacturing uh, uh, company, has announced that it's moving its headquarters out of Illinois to Texas. Now, there's a lot of reaction on both sides of the political aisle to this. We see Governor Pritzker saying we're talking about uh, a couple of hundred office jobs, not manufacturing jobs. And at the same time, he says the manufacturer has added manufacturing jobs in Illinois over the last couple of years. Republicans, on the other hand, are saying, hey, this is another illustration that Illinois is bad for business. Jerry, what's the, the, what's the fallout from this? And of course, you know, it follows the news of Boeing doing something similar. It does. And I think the big thing about Caterpillar is it's called Illinois Home for about 100 years. Um, there's still going to be about 17,000 manufacturing jobs uh, from the company here. Uh, we don't know if those are going to move out in the future. I mean, it's pointless to speculate whether that'll happen or not. But um, just just the fact that they've uh, viewed Irving, Texas as a, as a better spot than Illinois. Um, I think it was about five years ago that Caterpillar moved its headquarters from Peoria to Deerfield. So it didn't have too many, uh, you know, it, it hadn't been in Deerfield that long, but um, the fact that Illinois um, wasn't the right fit for it now, I think it's certainly something uh, that you have to consider if you're a lawmaker in the state. Um, uh, but, you know, it, and it's it sort of, upstaged a Monday announcement from the governor that uh, a Ferrero uh, North America was uh, putting uh, expanding its chocolate manufacturing uh, footprint in the Bloomington normal area um, by about 200 jobs or so uh, and and then the next day you see caterpillars leaving so it's it's the governor's trying to tout the winds where he can but uh, his opponents will have an easy sell um, trying to tie that to uh, the state's uh, business-related policies. John, when it comes to the Republican line on this, that Illinois is bad for business, that they, there are businesses and corporations moving at least their headquarters, if not their entire operation, to states like Texas where there is no income tax or there are better incentives, how critical is it that Illinois kind of change that message and be able to attract these larger companies? Well, it's... Uh question i guess of uh first of all i wonder I, I i wonder if it is actually caterpillar the the heavy manufacturer that's living uh going to texas or whether uh texas governor greg abbott knows what company's coming i saw a tweet from governor abbott that uh uh welcomed uh caterpillar c-a-t-a-p-i-l-l-a-r so um uh i guess that's uh they're not as they're they're they they need to uh, uh, get steeped in the in the tradition of of cat that uh, Illinois, as Jerry mentioned earlier, and, and I, I think this kind of move is is more psychologically damaging. I mean, the the psychological damage is as great or greater than the economic damage, and we saw this uh, in terms of the climate changing. We we had four years of. Uh, Republican Governor Bruce Rauner from 2015 to 2019 saying that very thing. We've got a bad climate for business. He wanted to make um, changes in collective bargaining in uh, the way corporations um, are taxed. Uh, and the, the response from the Democrats was always, sure, we could, we could uh, change our laws and be more like a Tennessee or another state in the South where uh, right to work state, um, there are more, there, they, they contended that there are more, you know, workplace uh, injuries, for example, um, that, you know, regulations are not as tight. So it's, it's a trade off one way or another. Um, the, I guess the messaging has to be that uh, if, if you're not gonna change the way business is done in Illinois is that Illinois is, uh, 
it's hard. I guess the 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 people that the laborers benefit from um, collective bargaining from strong unions that have safety rules and 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 higher wages probably than other places. Um, they're not the big campaign contributors, and so it's it's hard to. Uh, uh, draw corporations in by saying, you'll pay your workers more. <laughs> sure, sure. Uh, that's just one of the things that uh, Governor Pritzker is going to have to work on in terms of messaging and whoever his Republican challenger turns out to be for the November election. Another, uh, I suppose, bad news headline is that we're hearing again of a COVID outbreak at an Illinois veterans home, this time in Mantino. Uh, more than a dozen people infected, at least one person uh, infected but asymptomatic has died. Uh, John, coupled with LaSalle and this argument over whether LaSalle and the Quincy Veterans Home issue uh, with Legionnaire's disease are the same or even comparable, how damaging is this outbreak, which we're just learning about this week, and, and how bad could it get, do you think? Well, the... the um response from the first administration, as I read uh, in Jerry's story, as a matter of fact, uh, seems to be um, pretty swift, or at least they're making it sound as if being pretty swift. I think the lesson was learned from LaSalle. And this is a case, this is a situation where we're, we're post vaccine. So a lot of these, according to the Department of Veterans Affairs, the, the a lot of the people were asymptomatic. Um, one person who died was on hospice care and, and died shortly after receiving a, a booster shot. What's damaging about Mantino is LaSalle. LaSalle was so poorly handled. Um, this, this is a facility that through the, the worst part of the pandemic, the early part, went eight months, 10 months, eight months without any any COVID whatsoever. And then once it was introduced, and it should have never been introduced because there were just rules that were not, you know, basic public health rules that were not being followed, it just spread like wildfire. And there was a very slow response. So had, had LaSalle been handled a lot better, um, Mantino wouldn't be um, as much of a problem. But all, all of an opponent of Governor Prisker has to say is, We've got people dying at, an, at another veterans home and this is horrible. So, you know, that that resonates with with people. Sure, sure. Uh, Jerry, in, in your reporting on this, do you agree that the, the response is swifter? It appears to be more coordinated than LaSalle? I think that was the goal of the news release that was sent out yesterday was to say, you know, hey, IDPH is here. We're following all these protocols. Um, different protocols than were in place than in 2020 um, uh, during the LaSalle home outbreak. Uh, I'm still waiting on a few follow-up questions as of the time of this discussion, uh, just to try to figure out was there, was there a symptom, symptomatic individual that uh, necessitated the added testing or was it just a routine testing that, that showed up um, this positive case and they tested everybody? There's a little bit of clarity I'm still trying to get um, even on the, the person who died or trying to find out his, his age um, and a couple other things uh, that I haven't gotten a response from uh, DVA yet. But uh, the fact that IDPH was there, according to the Veterans Affairs Department, um, hours after the test, I mean, it, it's certainly a different response um, than we saw with uh, LaSalle and all of the residents are now vaccinated, of course, uh, November 2020 vaccine wasn't out yet. Um, when the first outbreak 36 people died, all the uh, residents uh, affected now were vaccinated that the person who died died, they said hours after their booster and hours after a positive test. So I don't know if they, they tested positive first and then they gave them the booster, but um, whatever happened there. Um, but anyway, the fact that the vaccine is here makes this a considerably different story um, than than what we saw in November 2020. Hopefully the vaccine does its job and the, the symptoms remain mild as IDVA has said um, they are for, for these individuals thus far. Some don't have symptoms at all, they say. So hopefully this is as big as a story gets. You don't wanna see um, your veterans dying. You don't wanna see people in state care. You don't wanna see anyone dying because of a virus, but um, 
yeah, it's not going to, even if this is handled success, successfully, it's not going to mute the impact that LaSalle is going to have on the election and that it's had on so many people's lives. Certainly. Speaking of the election, we continue to see new polling and analysis of the original polling from the Chicago Sun-Times and Chicago Public Radio, WBEZ, that showed a, a big jump for State Senator Baron, uh, Darren Bailey in his race uh, for the GOP nomination for governor. That gap appears to be widening. He's even increasing his lead over Aurora Mayor Richard Irvin. Uh, Jerry, is there any point at this, or any way at this point that you think the, the tide changes or is Darren Bailey looking like the presumptive nominee? Yeah, I wouldn't say presumptive nominee at this point, but the, the polls certainly indicate that Richard Irvin is not connecting with voters. Uh, maybe that's because every time he goes up in a news conference, it seems like he's trying to stick to one or two talking points and he's just repeating them over and over again. Um, but something there, uh, the voters are just not connecting with him, even if he believes that he could get things done in Springfield, whereas Darren Bailey, who only passed two bills and his two terms in office, uh, maybe couldn't get things done. You know, the voters don't want to hear that. They, they, it appears these polls suggest that Darren Bailey is viewed as more sincere and far more likable, I think, is one of the main takeaways I got. I think um, Darren Bailey was way ahead on, on likability, uh, favor or uh, viewed favorably, and, and uh, uh, Richard Irvin was underwater, as they say, in that he was more unfavorable with voters than he was favorable. John, is this a, a question of candidates, or is this an issue of a, a perhaps a sea change in the Illinois Republican Party? We heard uh, Senate Republican leader Dan McConkie earlier this year saying that the Illinois GOP is not the party of Trump, but with Darren Bailey and a, a highly conservative base, is that changing? I'm not sure if it's, 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 it's something that the... Uh, Trump crowd would like to see change. I was in Athens, which is about 20 minutes north of Springfield on uh, Wednesday, on Tuesday uh, of this week to see Darren Bailey appear uh, at a bar and grill there. Um, he's on his, he's on a uh, 102 counties in the, before election day. And um, the stop there was one of uh, that the, the, I heard that repeatedly from people who appeared that um, the Republican Party it has lost touch. The traditional Republican Party is not working for the people, um, and likability is um, th this is a group that uh, almost to a person mentioned that. Um, Darren Bailey knows how to communicate. He's been communicating from day one. They were really impressed ab about his um, challenge of Governor Pritzker in the courts uh, on uh, a mask mandate, which he won in the court of jurisdiction where he filed it, but then was uh, not successful in uh, uh, later proceedings uh, to apply to the, the, the entire state. They, they're uh, uh, strongly enamored of him because of his faith. Um, I was unaware, and I was told I was uh, uh, educated about his daily devotional, the Daily Bailey. He's got a devotional online every day, and um, so this is a very traditional um, conservative um, base for for Bailey. And I'll and I'll add that. Um, um, one Trump endorsed candidate, Mary Miller for Congress, who's running against a, another incumbent, um, uh, Mr. Davis, uh, his first name is- uh, Rodney Davis, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you, Rodney Davis. Uh, and she was there and she um, uh, spoke and spoke very highly, introduced Darren Bailey. And you know it was kind of interesting to see uh, that kind of connection there.
Sure, and the, that connection uh, is, is even drawing a higher profile name, perhaps, in that we're seeing yard signs, we're seeing people talk about um, a potential tie to former President Donald Trump. Trump has not made an endorsement in the Republican race for governor in Illinois, but there's some thought that maybe a late June visit to Illinois could include him uh, kind of shaking hands and, and giving his support to Senator Bailey. Uh, Jerry, does he need that support? Does he need that official endorsement from President Trump in order to kind of push things over the finish line? If you look at the polls, you'd think no, but um, it would certainly solidify that. There's a lot of uh, undecided voters in, in a lot of those polls that have come out recently. So usually those don't all break for one candidate um, as they would likely need to for Richard Irvin to reach that threshold. But, um, you know, Trump is a bump, uh, especially in a Republican primary. I don't know if that'll translate to the general. Um, it could. I'm not saying it won't. I, I think uh, I don't make election predictions, um, and I think it'll just have to be something to play out. And um, I think we'll just have to watch that uh, to see how it would play out in the long run if he gets it. Sure. John, we've seen kind of a bump for some candidates and for other candidates, perhaps perhaps not the same level of success when President Trump makes endorsements in other primaries so far this year. Do you think it makes a big difference in Illinois? No. Um, the, the Republican primary um, is... could could very well be um, like the, the 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 final stage if i if i'm a republican running for governor and i get the nomination that's in illinois that's almost these days almost the um crowning achievement because you've got such a hill to climb in november um in 2010 republican senator bill brady of bloomington won every state uh, every county outside of Cook uh, in uh, his race against incumbent Democratic Governor Pat Quinn and Quinn won Cook County. Um, Trump doesn't play well in Cook County. And um, I will say that um, if Darren Bailey continues with, with the message, I think that the one, one of the things downstaters see about Bailey and Irvin is that Irvin is Irvin is from the metropolis, the metropolitan area. He understands north of I-80. He's very attuned to crime in Chicago. As Jerry mentioned, he's he just uh, he's very focused on that issue, um, but doesn't know anything about downstate. Whereas Darren Bailey is a farmer. He understands downstate and he also has an understanding of the problems of Chicago. So there's the difference there. Um, but again, whether that translates into a win in November um, is a much bigger question. Sure. John, you mentioned uh, the gun and, and violence issues in the city of Chicago. That's become a campaign issue, something Republicans are already criticizing Governor Pritzker and Chicago's mayor about uh, the number of, of gun crimes and, and violence within the city. There was reporting from uh, WTTW's Amanda Vinicky this week, and of course Amanda is a panelist on this program from time to time, that looked at ways that Illinois might be changing some of its own gun regulations uh, in the wake of the Uvalde school massacre and other issues going on within the city of Chicago and across the country. Those changes go anywhere from uh, updates to the FOID laws, to closing loopholes, to even so-called micro-printing of, of ammunition, a way to track ammunition in a little bit more accurate way. Um, John, I'll start with you. Any chance that those gun rules will change? And would those changes move the needle, do you think? There's always a good chance they'll change in Illinois because of the large super majorities that Democrats hold in both houses of the legislature. Although, once again, um, it's always wise to remember um, how different uh, the state is from Rockford to Cairo, um, that we're talking about two different 
worlds, really. Um, more conservative Democrats occupy Southern Illinois and are much uh, stronger Second Amendment uh, advocates. As, as to whether they'll move the needle, you know, the idea of micro stamping, what, what apparently occurs in, in New York apparently has adopted this law is that when, when a uh, firearm is fired, it um, imprints a number on the case, the casing, so that um, uh, even in an instance where a crime is committed and there's no gun at the scene, a gun can't be recovered, um, there will be shell casings. And allegedly you can trace the gun by using these, these numbers on these casings. I would say that, you know, that's not gonna, that's not gonna stop gun violence. However, I believe that the number of unsolved gun crimes is phenomenally high. And um, so, you know, the, the, in, in terms of solving those crimes and catching perpetrators, that might make a difference. And then we see, you know, the, 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 one of the things that conservatives also all, always say is, Put these people away for for life, you know, and and we've tried that, and we've got very we got full prisons as a result of that. But here, maybe it would make a difference of um, deterring others, knowing that you know if I fire this gun, I'm going to throw the gun in the river, but the casing is still going to be there unless I go and collect all the casings. Sure, Jerry, what's what's your uh, temperature on this? I mean. Does it change the way that Illinois is, is viewed or perceived on either side of, of the gun control debate? Well, I think with, uh, it, will it change the way um, many people think? I don't know that on the guns, too many people are willing to have their opinions changed, but what you often hear the governor say, what you often hear Mayor Lightfoot say is most of the guns in Chicago shootings come from states like Missouri or other neighboring states. So you can only do so much as the state of Illinois um, to regulate uh, firearms. Chicago has strict bans, but they come in there from other places, the weapons that is. So you're going to have a challenge uh, trying to make much of a wave on uh, guns from a state legislature perspective. Um, it doesn't mean they're not going to try. There doesn't mean there's not, not, not a reason to try. But um, I think, you know, the FOID had a pretty significant uh, overhaul. Was it last year somewhere, something like last year um, uh, that sort of gave Illinois State Police greater authority to revoke um, guns from people who've had their cards revoked or uh, expired or whatnot. Um, so there's there's been changes to the FOID. Um, guns are certainly going to be an election issue. I just don't know um, how much many people are going to to move on that issue. Sure. Uh, just about a minute or so remaining. And Jerry, I wanted to ask you about uh, a new potential settlement um, in the ComEd scandal. There's a proposal before the Illinois Commerce Commission that ratepayers uh, in ComEd, customers within ComEd's territory, might be able to get uh, a $38 million payout. It would be, of course, spread across all those customers uh, in regards to the bribery scandal that's surrounding that company. It includes former House Speaker Michael Madigan. Is this going to be enough to change the culture when it comes to these types of scandals in Illinois? Well, I, I don't know that I, you know, there's there's always going to be people trying to do things they shouldn't do as long as there's positions of power. But uh, I think what's changing the culture with ComEd is the federal investigative activity more so than any civil thing would do. Uh, you got indictments coming down left and right. Uh, that's probably the better contributor to culture change. Certainly. We are less than two weeks now before the Illinois primary on June 28th. Early voting, of course, is open across the state, and we'll certainly be keeping an eye on those issues and much more right here on Capitol View. But unfortunately, we're out of time. Lots more to talk about, and we hope that you join us next time. John O'Connor, Jerry Nowicki, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. 
and I'm Jennifer Fuller. We'll catch you next time on Capital View.